And welcome back. So, quick breather from a very back. intensive session, a lot yeah. of information, yeah. a lot of data to digest. Um, yeah, seems it's some very high level thinking stuff that we need to really think about. And we're, we're now coming forward with, with, with our closing keynote speaker, someone who's going to really try and wrap everything we've heard of. Mm. You know, with a lot of today has been talking about future focus. How do we go forward? What's, what's the future hold in store for us? Um, and, and Frederick John is going to help us talk about something that which I think a lot of people maybe haven't even considered, mm. which is smart cities. Yeah. We need smart cities. Devan, yeah. I'm going to let you introduce the man. I know he's yes, a good please. friend. He's a good and, friend. Uh, take it forward. Uh, yeah, this is much more than business. So a very warm welcome, Frederick. Welcome to South Africa. Welcome from South Africa. Great to have you with us. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Devan. Thank yeah. you very much, Rob, for the warm welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure, and it's well-deserved. And I've been waiting for this session uh, for the entire conference, and I'm sure we're going to finish off in style. So thank you. Uh, I mean, you're a scholar. Uh, I think uh, uh, all the delegates are going to figure out what a smart guy you are once you start, uh, once you start presenting. Uh, I'm not going to hold you back any further. Uh, please, advise all us. Right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Devan. You're putting pressure on me. Thanks for that. Excellent. But I guess, <laughs> I guess it's quite a challenge for me to, to be after all these great presentations and, and great speakers. Uh, but I'll do my best to to keep you entertained and to inform you with relevant insights. Uh, so let me kick off this presentation with one question for, for the audience and also for the host. Who gardens? Do you garden a bit? Uh, I guess it's it's quite pleasant on Sunday or you know when it's sunny in the in, in South Africa. Do you garden, Robin Devan? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm mostly gardened by, um, by trying to repair the damage my son does to my, my garden, to be honest. <laughs> well, you know, if it can reassure you, I'm not really a specialist here. I don't have green fingers. And the only plant that I have at my place, actually, just right there, uh, well, it's just a, a plant of fresh mint for my mojitos. So yes. I'm not a good example. But from what I know, if I want a flower to grow, I need an adequate soil, right? So this soil can vary from one location to another. And also it's not always the same depending on the type of plant or flower you want to have. Well, in immobility, in electric mobility, that's exactly the same. If immobility is a flower, then it needs an appropriate substrate that is a smart city. So I propose to explore this ecosystem together and share some global perspectives for the next 15 minutes or so. And then we'll have a break and um, we'll go through some Q and A's and some thoughts together. All right. So here is the menu I prepared for you today. And well, apologies in advance if I make references to restaurants and bars, but it brings a bit of joy to me during the lockdown because I'm, I'm starting to be a bit tired of Deliveroo and Uber Eats uh, at the moment. So, but that's another topic. Uh, there will be three parts today. What is a smart city? I'll try to bring some definitions and some clarity about what is it, what it is in theory. And then I will talk you through how we can identify a smart city in the reality, shifting from theory to, to, to reality. And, and last but certainly not least, why do we need smart cities? Why is it important to include in the mobility and the electric mobility reflection a smart city perspective? So I guess we can start, sit back, relax and enjoy the ride with me. Let's jump straight into the main topic. What is a smart city? It's quite difficult actually to define what it is right now. So let's try to visualize it together. And I like to use this visualization from the Woven City project. It's a smart city project led by Toyota, the car manufacturer, and the project that has just kicked off, uh, it was last week. So imagine a city where we would have our health monitored around the clock, we would be protected from crime thanks to predictive policing, a bit like in the minority report film. We would ride in autonomous vehicles, we would drive electric vehicles, and we will breathe clean air. These are some of the promises that smart cities will bring uh, very soon. More formally, this is how we at Nikaman Strategic Advisors, we define what is a smart city. And our managing director, uh, Lucas Nickerman, says, a smart city combines its data, 
its resources, its infrastructure, and its people to continue to focus on improving liveability. A smart city is an aggregation of power and creativity, but also a body of data and live analysis. And I really like this analogy between our, our body on the, our human anatomy and what is a smart city, because it helps us to understand how complex, how large this ecosystem is. So let's reuse this analogy together. Let's imagine this guy is a smart city, all right? Well, where would we be? In this case, we would be at the place of the heart, us citizens, residents, because the heart is said to be the center of our emotions, but also the, the pump, the engine of our body. Mobility in that case would be the circulatory system, like the blood flowing around our body, um, our circulatory system feeds our muscles, our organs, our entire body. And mobility is exactly the same. Think about how COVID-19 has made our world paralyzed, being stuck at home, not seeing our friends and family and suffering from disturbed economy are some of the unpleasant outcomes of an immobile world. But now a body can also survive if there are other organs working together, right? And it's exactly the same for a smart city. A smart city needs different industries to exist. This is the case of um, finance, for example. We need smart payment, mobile payment, contactless payment, and so on. That's the case also for real estate. So think about the charging points, the drop-off zone for shared mobility, the docks for scooters, bikes, and so on. The real estate industry is experiencing a, re a revolution because or, or thanks to mobility. Another example would be energy. We need to power cities with green electricity, with renewable energy. And I think that the last presentation from Robert was very clear about the importance of this. Each industry are, in this analogy, similar to one organ. They are independent and dependent between each other. An organ can work on its own, right? It's quite independent, but it has to work with the other organs in order to, to make our body uh, working. And that's exactly the same for in industries related to smart cities in which we can include mobility. In fact, mobility and smart cities are two sides of the same coin. So now I hope that you understand a bit better um, what is a smart city on paper. So now let's move to the reality. How many smart cities exist out there? Well. I don't know. I cannot answer that question, unfortunately. Because what is the threshold as of which a city is intelligent or not? That's a very interesting question because there is no real metric to define this threshold. There are probably lots of smart cities out there or smart cities to be, but how can we identify? And in fact, is a smart city, the, the notion of smart city, is it a binary principle? Can a smart city be, can a city be smart or not? Is it black or white? For me, smart city should be a gradual notion. We should have some granularity in uh, the way we define and identify smart cities. And I guess one more time, the, the analogy between us and smart city is very relevant because it's like with human. Who is smart? Who is not? How can we define someone is intelligent? That may sound like a weird question, but it is quite important for some industries and more specifically the, the university business. That is a, that is a big business. Uh, I just got my MBA two years ago. And trust me, when, when you apply for a master's, for an MBA or a bachelor's, well, most universities will want to make sure that you are intelligent enough to, to join their program. And the way that they assess this is by using um, tests that we call IQ test. And I took here an example that is quite famous around the world. It's the GMAT. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this test, um, if you've tried it already. I'm sure you would understand the pain I'm talking about. But the point is, can we think about a GMAT test, but for cities? Can we think about a test that will grade the intelligence level of one city? Well. During my research, 
I actually found that such, such tests already exist. But the thing is, they will assess parts of this holistic notion that is a smart city. It's not 100% accurate to address uh, what is a smart city. So when I looked at those tests, I identified four different parts, factors, that should be all of them included in the smart city notion. And the first one is the current level of development. Where does one city stand in terms of development? There is a great study uh, developed by the IEC, uh, Cities in Motion, that is a yearly study that will assess this uh, particular variable. Another very important point is the people perception. What do people think about their city? Are they well? Are they happy? So two reports are assessing this particular factor. One is from the University IMD Smart City Index, and the other one is from the World Happiness Report. Uh, just a side note, the World Happiness Report for the first time last year also published a study focused on cities and not only on, 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 on at the national level, not only based on countries. Another aspect is the strategy. A city needs a strategy to be smart. So Ronan Berger, the consulting firm, um, assesses this particular factor with the Smart City uh, Strategy Index. And last but certainly not least, um, the sustainability aspect is assessed by Arcadis with the Sustainability Cities Index. And I'm sure that now you understand how important it is to include sustainability aspects in a smart city strategy for, for, for one city, right? So altogether, those factors will form this smart city principle. They will give a much more accurate vision of where a city stands in, um, in the smart city journey. So I wanted to understand how a city such as London would score on these different reports and what score I would get if I add up all the different positions from these different indices and reports. So this is what I did. And let's say that on the right hand side of this graph, well, we would have a sort of smart city score or something like this. And I wanted to compare the position of London with other cities. So I chose Vienna, Singapore, Paris, and Chicago. Why those cities? Well, there is not a scientific method uh, behind the selection. And this raises one comment regarding those studies. Sometimes one city will be assessed in one report, but not in another one. And there is a lack of understanding regarding why this city is assessed and why this city is not assessed in another report. So that would be probably one, one comment we can make regarding those different reports. Another interesting comment is look at Singapore and look at the people perception. So Singapore will rank first in the IMD's uh, Smart City Index and 103rd in the World Happiness Report. But both of them are based on people perception. So what can we say is perhaps they are not exactly ass assessing um, the, the, the same variable in the same way. And um, perhaps we should, we should bring this granularity uh, perspective in the way that we assess one smart city. So the point of this slide is, if we really want to have an idea of where a smart city is on its smart city journey, we should have a sort of combination of the different reports, studies, rankings, indices that exist out there and create a sort of custom uh, ranking, custom report that will be relevant depending on which objective one city wants to pursue to be smart. Because no city will want to turn smart for the sake of being smart. I mean, there is probably no fun behind this. It's a lot of, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of effort. So you want to pursue one objective. And in, during my research, well, I found four different objectives that one city will want to pursue to be, um, uh, to, to be intelligent. One is to improve sa security, safety. And this is the case of Cairo, for example, in Egypt. Another objective could be to fight climate change. Jakarta is a great example. Some city will want to improve the well-being, the experience of its residents. And this is the case of Singapore. And last but not least, some may, may want to be a living laboratory, like it is the case for uh, the Wuhan City project led by Toyota.
This classification is not hermetic. One city can have a primary objective for which we will extract, we will assess the city on relevant variables. And then um, a city can also pursue secondary objectives so that one city can you know, navigate in uh, the selection of objectives and respond the best uh, in the best possible way to residents' needs. All right. So now, no matter how, how one city ranks or the objective uh, the city will pursue, there is one common factor that pushes cities around the world to look for smart solutions. And this is the urbanization trend. This is really important because our cities are getting packed. And I'm sure that, well, you are all very well familiar with this graph of the United Nations saying by 2050, we're gonna be around 10 billion people on earth and 70% of us will live in cities by 2050. All right, this is true, but the 70% ratio, which is the urbanization rate is true, but not really relevant for um, most of developed countries. As you can see on this graph, so on the left-hand side, you will have the urbanization rates of different regions around the world. And on the left-hand side, you will have the urbanization rate of different countries around the world in which you will find South Africa in green. Well, the threshold of 70% is already reached um, for, for, for lots of different countries and regions. And this is represented by the red line. And South Africa is very, very close to be above the threshold of 70%. So, this urbanization rate, the fact that people are moving in in cities and the fact that cities are growing, well, has an impact on the way that we manage land and on the construction side of one city. So if we trust the data of the United Nations and also from the different reports, it will mean that for the next 70 years, we will have to build every day a city of the size of Manhattan. That's a lot of square meters to build. And of course, the sustainability aspect here is very important to include. And as you can imagine, well, sometimes it changes completely the, the landscape of one city. Look, for example, here, the example of Shanghai. Shanghai in 1990 and Shanghai in 2020. Well, hopefully there is this sort of clock in the picture to, 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 to help us to understand that we're talking about the same region because, well, Otherwise, that would be difficult to recognize it. So now I'd like to ask you a question. Which city is the most populated? Think about it. Is it Tokyo, Delhi, Shanghai? Not easy to tell, right? But there is a big difference. In 2020, Tokyo had over 37 million people, whereas Delhi had 30 and Shanghai 27. Keep these examples in mind. You will quickly understand why I am sharing you, sharing you this. What the urbanization rate tells us is how big our cities are, how many, or what is the share of the population that, um, that lives in cities. And this number will grow. And as a result, the number of big cities around the world will grow as well. So by 2030, we will have 109 cities with more than 5 million people. And the biggest growth will be for uh, the cities between five to 10 million people. And you can see it with the bars on the right-hand side of the graph. We will shift from 48 in 2018 to 66 in 2030. But in fact, the issue is not that much related to how big a city is, but how fast a city gets big. And this is not the urbanization rate anymore but the population growth rate, the urbanization growth rate. And the United Nations says that in order to have a sustainable growth rate, a city should have a population growth below or equal to 1% per year. And as you can see with this graph, well, it's not quite the reality for the next 10 years. So I can understand it's a bit complicated to understand this graph, but basically it represents a share of cities depending on their on their size in terms of people and in green you will have the share of cities around the world with a population rate growth rate that will be below one percent for the next 10 years until 2030 and in red 
the share of cities with uh, a population growth rate that will be above 1%. So in other words, what does this graph tell us is around 50% of the cities around the world with more than 1 million people will grow at a unsustainable growth rate. So I can understand that the growth rate, while it's sometimes difficult to, to realize what does it mean, how many people we're talking about. And this is why I'd like to show you an example. If we take a city of 30 million people with a growth rate of 3% per year, it means that the city will have to absorb, to welcome 900,000 people every day, uh, every year, sorry, which is the population of, uh, of Brussels. So now if we go back to our examples or three examples, what will be their population in 2030? Well, Tokyo, they will be fine. The population will decrease and you know, you know that, that uh, Japan has an aged population, but for Delhi and Shanghai, that will be something completely different. Sh Delhi will have to welcome more than 900 people for the next 10 years, every year, and Shanghai around 600,000 people. Another very interesting example looking a bit further in the future is Lagos. Lagos for the next 30 years, the next three decades, will have to welcome at least 600,000 people every year, which is the equivalent to plus 1,640 people per day. So why am I say you, singing you this? Well, it's because I guess it leads me to the main, main message of this presentation, whether it's regarding electric vehicles or smart cities, a smart environment will only make sense if we're intelligent too. We all know that technology will meet our expectations. I mean, for the last two days, we've, some, we've seen brilliant people, brilliant projects, uh, great initiatives. So we know that the technology will, will meet our, what we expect. But will it be the same for us? Will we meet our own expectations? And so, I guess we are the engine of smartness and the mobility revolution, smart cities are just around the corner. So my message to you is let's be smart together. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, feel free to connect with me, drop me a line via email, scan the QR code here if, here if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. And now I guess that uh, it's over to you, Divan and Rob, and we'll have a break or perhaps some Q and A's. What would you prefer? Frederick, let's just, let's just jump straight into some questions. I mean, there, yeah. I think there's, it's, it's a concept that I think many South Africans, um, you know, you talk about, you know, places like Shanghai and Tokyo and London. And, you know, the, these, are, these are places which we regard as, as very, quite frankly, I think we regard them as first world yeah. cities. And, and, you know, we, we're, we're not on that spectrum. So I think the idea of a smart city in South Africa is probably something that is, I don't want to say quite foreign to many South Africans, but saying that the, most of us are, are, find it a little bit difficult to understand so maybe my, my first question to you is if you could just define for us in one statement what would you define and say you know a smart a city in order for it to be smart must be you know it must improve have, the, must have well, x it, yes well it, it must improve the life of its citizens uh, unfortunately uh, I think there is a there is a confusion between smart and data technology. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Um, I think that a, a city will be smart if it addresses the citizens' needs. And there is a very interesting, let's say, new trend or parallel trend in the smart city industry that is called resilient cities. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, with this terminology, but basically what they say is, well, smart cities are fine, but really, really based on technology, really based on data and so on and so on. What we want to do with resilient cities is to really start from what do people need? What do people want? And then let's look at how we can create this technology or the tools, the means to successfully address those needs. And I think that's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting approach. And the bottom line of my, my answer is would be, well, we really need to look at the livability aspect of one city. And I think that the presentations that were performed today and yesterday really put in, in you know, the focus on the sustainability aspect of all those projects. And certainly electric, electric mobility will be important because on top of 
you know, decreasing direct emissions in, in city centers, it will address lots of different issues. Noise, for example, but also if you look at, you know, V2G, you know, vehicle to vehicle to grid, that is part of the vehicle to everything um, uh, communication systems. Well, this is a great, as well, a great feature to, um, to improve the, 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 the liveability of people in cities. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, let, let's talk about, it's obviously COVID, um, everyone had to work from home, mm -hmm. COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, we've seen it in South Africa and you, you even mentioned it yourself, you know, you work, you work from home. Um, big cities, New York in particular, is one that springs to mind where I read an article that said, you know, they saw a lot of people moving out of central New York and, and, and dare I say, a, a de-urbanization effect caused by COVID-19 because people said, well, if I'm going to work from home, I'm going to go do it from the suburbs or I'm going to go, I'm going to move out of the city. What, what are you, what are you, what's your take on that? I mean, do we, do, do you see that being reversed and people coming back to the cities or, or is there a de-urbanization effect due to things like COVID-19? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I think nobody knows the, the, the simple, the simple answer right now, it's nobody knows, but um, we are currently writing a study about uh, the, the effect of new, new modes of transport, uh, COVID-19, work from home, new real estate developments and so on. So the takeaways right now are, there is not a day urbanization. Uh, people are moving outside of cities or at least some people are moving outside of cities, but it's not to, to go in rural areas, it's to go in, in other cities. Cities that will have other characteristics, perhaps uh, a cost of living that will be lower, perhaps um, you know there will be sea, mountains, a better weather or whatever. But people are not leaving cities. There is just a another balance that will be perhaps found between mega cities and other cities. Now that is one thing. The second thing is work from home will won't be for everybody. And even if you can work from home, perhaps you don't want to work from home, um, or at least not 100% of your time, which would have an impact in the way that companies will offer their office services. Um, in the way that companies will ask you to come or not to their office. So I had some, some discussions with developers and, and um, office managers of big corporates, and they say that, well, Fred, what is undisputable is we will need less square meters or square feet um, in cities. That is, that is for sure. But as we need less space, we will want to have a better quality regarding this space. So instead of you know being in zone two or the zone three of cities, we will want to be in zone one. We will want to be in the very center of cities uh, because we will we understand our that our people are suffering from COVID, they are suffering from working from home. It's not good for physical health, mental health and so on. So if there is something we can do for them is to offer them a comfortable office that it that is easily accessible. Now what does it mean? It means that where they were before in zone two, zone three, and, and so on, there will be overnight new spaces that will be available. And what are we going to do with that? Well, I spoke with architects and, um, and, and real estate agents, um, uh, real estate agencies, and they said that now the, the future of real estate will not be to build cities in silos, you know, having neighborhoods where you will have uh, residents only and then business districts such as La Défense in Paris or Canary Wharf in London. We will, we will want to have a, a blended environment, an environment where we will find residential, real, uh, residential properties, but also offices, retail, schools, swimming pools, activities, whatever. But the idea is really to build a community. And this, uh, this principle of community is very interesting if you include the mobility aspect, yeah. because one of the big drivers of mobility right now is on top of, of course, electric electric vehicles is uh, shared mobility. And if we want shared mobility to be a success, well, those blended areas in cities could be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting way to fast track um, uh, shared mobility. A third point will be for those people moving outside of cities, let's say, for example, you are too far away from the main HQ to, to travel there even one or two times a week. Well, then they will probably have a decentralized management of offices. In other words, I'm not quite sure that 
providing offices will have to be internal uh, of companies. So in other words, I'm not quite sure that corporates should be should be still in charge in house of um, providing offices to their employees, uh, especially if if they opt for a decentralized model, because it's going to be quite complex in terms of logistics, in terms of, you know, managing those spaces to to offer um, workspaces to their to their to their people uh, closer to where they will be living uh, in other cities that won't be mega cities. Fantastic. I mean, yeah. it, it's. I think. I think what you're saying is is is, is that it's. We're going to have to reimagine our cities. That the, the COVID has taught us yeah. that things are going to. But we're going to have to reimagine what a city is. And I think that that ties really well in with everything we've been talking for the last two days. Is we've been reimagining mobility, mm -hmm. and now we need to expand that that to to reimagining our cities. Devon, yes. uh, exactly. And how everything will fit in, Frederick. So between the cars and the scooters and the bicycles and the bikes. Now we've got this fantastic city that's, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, new age, you know, so to speak. But somehow people need to navigate through it from a train uh, to a taxi to an e-bike. And how do you see it playing out? Uh, do you have separate lanes maybe? Do you have separate zones where you say at this point, you know, no buses allowed? Please maybe talk us to your thinking on, on that. Yeah, well, uh, that's a very interesting point. Um, so I guess there are different visions. Uh, they will first the, the the simplest answer is there is no one solution that will fit all. As I said, you know, smart cities and soil. Well, you will have different soil depending on you know on depending on what you want to plant mm -hmm. and where you want to plant. Um, so you, we really need to have this local approach, you know. But that being said, lots of cities, um, especially in Europe, are now thinking about banning cars, banning. ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars, uh, from their city centers. So from one day to another, it will free up a lot of spaces in cities um, that, will, that will be very valuable for developers to, um, to leverage for other modes of transport. So I'm thinking about mm -hmm. bikes, scooters, uh, to create dedicated lane. Um, there, you know, if you want a concrete example, when I speak to fleet managers, um, so of course they are considering electric uh, electric vehicles, but they also want to include now micro mobility options and also shared mobility options with public transport and so on. But they say, well, you know, right now the thing is uh, we are not that keen to include micro mobility options because for a safety perspective, now cities are not safe enough to give our employees bikes, scooters, and so on um, instead of a car. It's not a general point. Of course, there are some companies offering bikes and so on. When I was working in Brussels, I could have a bike, for example, but um, th it's still a concern. So if, if you want to address that, we will have probably to rethink our infrastructure. And the fact that we will decrease the number of cars in city centers will be a big factor to, to, to accelerate that thinking, yes. Okay, so so you know one of the surprising things for me in the last in the last year, uh, Frederick, is is although you know COVID and every and it was not just you know COVID's probably the first um, thing that's a, it's a global phenomenon. We've all experienced it. It isn't it isn't you know it isn't one country specific or one country. So it was, we had an economic recession and another country managed to survive it. There, there isn't any any country on 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 the earth that has been left untouched by COVID. However, all the stats we've seen over the last couple of days have pointed towards that in 2020 we still saw a boom of electric vehicle sales. I mean, it, yeah. everyone knows that you know, Tesla, Elon Musk was momentarily the wealthiest man in the world. Um, you know, te Tesla's flying. How, how do we explain that while we all went through this COVID pandemic, are, are, are we as humans more aware and therefore now turning to our EVs? I mean, what, what, what started this and, and can we sustain it? Yeah, well, uh, I guess that's part of the answer indeed, Rob, you're right. Um, so I heard some very, very interesting input from Glacia and from Gay Gaylord during their presentations, and, and they were very right. Um, there are different aspects. First, uh, legal aspect, let's say. Uh, all the subsidies, all the fiscal incentives to buy an electric vehicle or to lease a vehicle, an electric vehicle, whatever. Uh, in Europe, most of most of countries in Europe are really, really active to, to promote that. Another aspect, still under the, 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 the policy perspective, 
is, as I said, um, in very soon, only electric vehicles will be uh, allowed in some city centers. Um, so you will want to be future proof, I guess. Uh, some people are already thinking about it and especially corporates. You know, um, fleet managed by corporates are really, uh, really important to um, influence um, you know, the, the sales, uh, the adoption between ICE, uh, ICE vehicle and electric vehicle. Another point that is very important is also that we are realizing that we need electric vehicles. And when I say we, it's us, the end users, but also the, the OEMs. Um, if you look at the, the number of new models that will be electric in the near future, I think by 2022, there will be around 500 different uh, electric um, electric vehicle models, which is quite a lot. So they are realizing that, well, we need to do something here. We need to uh, we need to to increase our offering. Also, a trend that is quite exciting to follow if you're interesting uh, interested a bit in finance is all those new car manufacturers that are purely focused on electric vehicles and that are, um, you know, jumping into the, the the public markets through through SPACs and through uh, IPOs. I would be very curious to follow their uh, follow their evolution, and I think about, for example, um, Lucid. Well, I really like the design of the car, so that's uh, I guess uh, the, the example that comes to my mind. And another, and, and probably one of one of the last point I'd like to make on this question is the fact that people are realizing that an electric vehicle is quite interesting, but there mm -hmm. are still lots of barriers that are for me myth. They are false barriers for uh, the adoption of EVs. And I'm particularly thinking about three barriers, the range anxiety, uh, the charging points issue, and uh, the, the total cost of ownership. Uh, I think when the electric vehicle market um, kicked off somewhere around 2010, we started on the wrong, on the wrong foot with the wrong message or not the most appropriate message uh, to the end users for them to really understand what what are the benefits of an electric vehicle. And I think that now uh, OEMs uh, and stakeholders, mobility stakeholders on, on, in general, have understood that we need to change the message. Instead of talking about a kilowatt per hour in the battery or the range or the number of charging points that exist in the city, we should tell a story to 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 to, to the end users. We should show them how an electric vehicle will improve their life. The silence, the you know the the pleasure you will get by driving with an electric vehicle, the fact that you will save money, the fact that you won't smell diesel or petrol when you fill in your car, the fact that you will have you know like VIP parking slots in your shopping mall, um, you know, I, I, the the bottom line is we we should transit from instead of telling what a an autonomous uh, what a, an electric vehicle is. We should show the people what it is exactly to, to drive an electric vehicle. And this is what is happening now. Uh, I see, for example, the commercials uh, from OEMs that are completely changing. Um, and it, it goes towards the right direction. I'm very optimistic about the future for electric vehicle. Yeah. Fantastic. And, yeah. and I think finally, you know, what, I mean, obviously you're a big proponent, you're a big uh, champion of smart cities. Um, you know, it's, 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 your, it's your kind of, it's your, it's your, I don't know, your expertise, let's call it. Are there alternative models to smart cities that we should also be trying to understand and, and, and you know, that, that also could have an impact on, especially third world developing countries that, that mm. us as South Africans yes. will, be, will be kind of more mm. familiar with? Are there other models that we should be aware of? Yes. Uh, well, as I said, the resilient, uh, resilience, uh, responsive city model that is very interesting. Um, it is worth to have a look at their idea, their philosophy, um, because I think it could be very much relevant for uh, for South Africa. Another another principle that is quite uh, quite popular at the moment is the 15-minute city. Uh, perhaps you are familiar with this principle, but it can also be very well applied in in, in South Africa. And the basic the basics of uh, of this principle is to have everything around you within 15-minute journey by foot, by bike, or by scooter. And what I mean by everything is uh, school, activities, shops, restaurants, work. Um, so this is this is a very interesting model. And uh, also, I'm not sure it's an alternative. I'm not sure it is either smart city or 15-minute city. 
um, but it's a, it, it is an, an interesting um, an interesting idea too. And as I mentioned, well, um, this new thinking from real estate developers, city planners, to have this bl these blended communities between you know activities, retail offices, li uh, uh, life space, uh, you know the. The management of a city, the investment in, in real estate and so on, um, it's quite a conservative uh, industry. So it will take some time for them to, to process. But thanks to mobility and all the fantastic technology improvements that we are offering to, to people, they have to accelerate their uh, process thinking. And this is very good for us to, to, to develop cities that will meet our, uh, our needs in the future. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so I think, Frederick, I mean, for us in South Africa, I mean, it's something like a smart city. I'm glad you made the clarity between a smart city and a, a data city, because I think for a lot of South Africans, you know, we, we, we're only still getting to the point where some of our cities have like free Wi-Fi. You know, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to travel to some cities around the world where you know, a lot of city centers have free Wi-Fi. And it's, it's quite a foreign concept to South Africans. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal here when a city opens up free to use Wi-Fi. So I think for us, the, the, the establishment between a smart city which increases the livability for its occupants versus a data or a connected city and I think to understand that that difference has been really eye-opening for me I mean I I find that really, really intriguing and that you've made that distinction. Um, but I think, you know, looking to places like Lagos, I mean, the urbanization in South Africa, we're, we're probably just as much as on the high side as they are. I mean, Johannesburg is growing. You know, you, you only have to drive through Joburg to see how fast it's growing. Um, and, and to understand these models, I think, is really, really important for us as South Africans. But bringing it back to, to e-mobility and the question of e-mobility, I mean, you, you've obviously listened to a couple of our speakers. Um, I'm going to take the policy question off the table because everyone said policy. So policy, you're not allowed to say policy. If uh, if you, as Frederick John, and you were advising the South African government, and they said, "Okay, well, let's let's have one thing from from you as a as an expert in smart cities and you know what mobility means to a smart city," what would be the one thing you would encourage us as South Africans to try and do in the next 12 months to try and improve the uptake of e, e mobility and e fleets, for example, in South Africa? Oh, in one word, communication. Communication, communication, communication. This is really what we are seeing at Nikoman Strategic Advisors in our, in our work. We really need to improve communications between mobility stakeholders, electric mobility stakeholders, and, and users. Uh, and, and I'll go back to, to the three barriers that, that I mentioned, because uh, if you really look at the way that people use a car, not only an electric vehicle, but a car, the technology we have today with the infrastructure that we have today can meet around 95% of one driver needs. Sure. So I'm not quite sure that we need more and more and more and more, more kilowatt per hour, more charging points, more range. Of course, it would be nice if we had it. Sure. I'm not saying the opposite. But what I think now that what we need is just a bit more of common sense and a bit more of good communication, a communication that everybody will be able to understand. And it, as I said, it's going towards the right direction because I can feel a shift in the way that um, companies are communicating towards their customers. But it took more than 10 years to realize this. Yeah. Sure. So, so, so policy off the table, you're saying we, we need to focus on communication. We need, we need to yeah. educate people that they don't necessarily need more in their lives. But what we have is, is actually probably sufficient. Well, Rob, have you already met someone after trying an electric vehicle for the first time that didn't want to buy one? Yeah. No. no I, haven't. <laughs> I haven't. There you go. Yeah. So I suppose it's about it's about getting 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 dare I say getting bums in seats getting Test getting drives, people bums in seats exactly yeah and once you experience it you won't go back basically uh, well yeah. at least with the people that I know I, I don't know a single person in, in 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 my surrounding that would not want to use buy or whatever I, I'm not talking about money here but at least driving an electric vehicle after trying one. Yeah, 100%. Well, I think, um, you know, Frederick, on, on that bombshell, 
Um, I think it's, 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 it's been great to chat to you. I mean, I think you've opened a lot of our eyes to what the future can be. Uh, and, and, you know, I think as South Africans, we're slowly starting to kind of lift our head up and see, see what, the, what the future holds for us and understand that our cities, you know, we can be smart cities and we, we, can, yes. we can have cities like the Singapore's and, 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 the, and the London's of the world and the Paris's and, you know, these kind of, uh, these kind of you know, cities that we look to with envy and saying, this is a wow, smart cities, you know, in Australia. Australia, um, we can actually we can have that, and we just need to we just need to focus. We need to look at it. And we need to understand what is a smart city, and is increasing the livability of its occupants. And e-mobility is a big part of that. Absolutely. So, Frederick, you know, from myself, Rob, in, in studio, and Devon, uh, thank you for taking thank some time so out much. on your Tuesday. It's been absolutely an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Thanks so for having me. Um, and, and we wish you the best of luck and we will hopefully connect with you again soon in the, in the future um, and we'll, we'll chat about some more trends and some more kind of macro ideas as, as the world develops around us. So, Thanks, thanks for having me and uh, good luck. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Have a great Absolute afternoon. Pleasure. Great afternoon. So that's our last speaker, yeah. EMSA well, 2021. It's it done. Done and dusted. I think uh, wow. as, as, as a quick recap, we can we can talk you know this morning we've we've had some great speakers we know we had chris solwood from australia talking about uh, the future of mobility letting us letting us understand that there's a a vast mix of mobility that we we could be looking at and it's not just a simple yes. one shoe fits all and i think that that was yes. a, a really really insightful uh, piece of information they shared with us that you know it isn't it isn't just a one shoe fits all and i i like that idea yeah um, then you know, then we then we then we chatted to to Klesha. We've heard from Gaylor, who probably dropped the bombshell of, of the morning that there's going to be policy changes in South Africa, which most of our viewers will be interested in. South African context, we want to know what's happening in South Africa. Um, the guys, are, the policy changes are coming soon. He said, he quotes him, within the next six to twelve months, within the next year, there's going to be some fundamental policy changes. I'm sure, Devon, from your from from your side, you know what that means for the OEMs and everyone out there. Yes. Big, big issues, big bombshells today. Uh, such great news, and it's so rare to get great news. We are starting this new journey. It's a new language. And from the various speakers that we saw today, I felt the creativity, I felt the skills from all over the world. And as we embark on this journey, you know, there's so much good that we can take from these two days. Uh, and the very fact that the policy is going to change. For me, that's the biggest part. Sure. Because that's what's going to make the OEMs bring in the cars. That's what's going to incentivize the customers to buy the cars. Yep. And once the car's on the road, that's when you're going to see the energy for all the other stuff that's going to come. The charging stations, the thinking, the mindsets. People are going to test drive because now there's actual, actually cars to test drive. Sure. So that's point one. But then the creativity from all the scientists, from all the races, from, yep. uh, from the universities. We've got the creativity to take what the world has right now and take it to a totally new level. We've got the OEMs. We just need to feed the the right talent from the universities into the OEMs. And we can start creating stuff. We can start building our own cities with our own mindsets, with our own you know, level of infrastructure and creativity and get to a point where we are world leaders. We are maybe then ahead of Norway because we've invented things and discovered things that they haven't even thought of yet. Sure. So it's a new game. From what I could hear, uh, the future is bright and the future is electric. Yeah. So I think what we need to try and do is between you and I, let, let's try and... Let's try and wrap up. Mm. So day one, EMSA, we spoke about where we are as a country. We, we spoke about there's appetite for EVs, the, the infrastructure is coming through. Things are, things are happening and we're getting to the point where, where, where we want EVs. Everyone knows we need to have EVs. Everyone knows it's important. Um, and the overall kind of feeling was that as a, as a country, we are... We are probably closer to being ready for them than we thought we are. We, we, yes, we have some challenges with our grid, and that was spoken about, but on the private sector, and there's other players who are ready and willing to step in yes. and help change those challenges. So from a, from a grid and a power point of view, I, I, I think that that argument's kind of been put to bed. Yeah. I think that if I see anyone on the street anymore saying, you can't buy an EV because of load shedding, I'm going to say, well, you're not going to buy an EV right now, and within the next six to 12 months, you know, there's enough people coming on board that I believe that, that that's specific problem will be will be dealt with and i think that that's great to put that one to bed yeah 
then then we obviously you know we spoke about communication and i think unzet really summed up really nicely is that we need to start seeing communication to the general joe public that this is this is, evs are for everyone evs aren't just for top tier scientists people who are nouveau rich rich or whatever and they what they want to buy fan fancy we all need to move to make this move and we all need to understand it's coming to us and that to me kind of summarized day one and, and she obviously spoke about policy she spoke about what you just mentioned having options on the road you know people seeing it but also i think what she what she said which is really important and a lot of people gave feedback to us on this is that the rituals around owning a car we can't discount those rituals. Those are still part of what's us, what's uniquely South African, and we need to understand that. Yeah. And I think at the end of day two, we're now in a position where we can probably say there's three big things, I think, that we, that we as EMSA need to try and measure to say, in, in 12 months' time, do we achieve three big things? One, policy. Is the policy is going to be put in place to encourage EVs, to incentivize EVs, not just people to buy them, but more people like Inklantla Mazibuko, who wants to manufacture EVs in South Africa. And I know that you're very passionate about that. You know, we need to have local manufacturing. So that's the first thing. We need to measure in 12 months' time what has happened with policy. And then the second thing is, is that having someone like Klesha from one of the big OEMs showing us the the amount of new vehicles that they're going to be bringing in in the next 12 months yeah. starts to deal with with Anzet's point of having more options and we know there's other OEMs out there we all know VW is talking about electric I see today Volvo just announced they're going fully electric by 2030 mm -hmm. um, every major car brand is going down this road it's a matter of time before the more affordable spectrum of brands start bringing in EVs. So I believe that's going to take the next thing, which is we need to have more options available for the general public, which is, I think, to your point, to, to Anzet's point. And then I think the last thing is we need to see a fundamental shift and a change in how we communicate EVs to the people out there. And I think Frederick's touched on it. I think Anzet touched on it yesterday. I believe Chris touched on it this morning. Most of our speakers have spoken about it, is that we need to communicate different. And those to me would be three goals that I'm, I'm hoping us as EMSA next year, we can come back and say, we've achieved these three things. The yeah. policy has been put in place. There's more vehicles on the road. There's more options. There's more variety for people. And the communication on EVs has changed so that it's, it's a lot more in tune with what people want to understand. I think that those, I think setting more goals than that is probably unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I think if we can achieve those three things, mm -hmm. we'll see a massive uptick in, uptick in EVs. Mm -hmm. Thoughts from your side? I agree completely. And if I can add to that, um, we now have some targets for yep. the next 12 months. And uh, the policy is going to be the key. So once that policy kicks in, and I hope it's soon, we're going to see the OEMs bringing in more cars. Yes. Even more than they currently planned. And once that happens, but usually there's a lag. So from the time there's a light switch hit to the time a car gets on a ship from Europe and gets to our ports sure. and gets to the OEMs and gets to a dealer and, and gets onto the road, usually three to six months anyway. But at least now we know the process has started. Yeah. Look, we know we're probably behind the curve. We know we have to make up, but we've got more than enough time to make up. Yeah. And now that we're talking in all these important topics, the message is getting out there. And maybe the OEMs like BMW can start convincing other OEMs who do have electric vehicles, but they just have decided not to bring them yet mm. to please come on board because sure. it's the start of this new language that we're talking. And I think these two days have been brilliant in terms of highlighting these facts. Yep. Uh, and if people do need to talk to us, please reach out. Our contact details are available. We'd love to talk to you, partner with you, collaborate with you to see how we can get this going even further. Fantastic. So on that note, we're going to hold ourselves accountable. I think the three big things we're going to talk about in the opening keynote of EMSA 2022 will be policy change, volume, 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 mm -hmm. and not just volume of one brand, but volume of lots of brands. brands. Are we getting options out? Are there things for the guys in the entry level, middle level, and high level? And thirdly, has the communication shifted and how brands are talking about e-mobility has it shifted to the point where people are going to make a sustainable change to the way they live and understanding that you don't need the car that can do everything. Yeah. Actually, you need the car that can do 95% of what you need it. Yeah, yeah. And over and above, uh, if the, the incentivized electric vehicle can also be assisted with electric vehicle financing or any type of other 
method to make these cars more affordable. Yes. So I think that will be great. Uh, I mean, it's been brilliant to talk to you from Pretoria, guys. Our studio is fully solar powered, by the way, if you didn't know. Yeah, fully so solar powered. So we're, we're off the grid here. Our lights and everything has been great. We, 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 have, we haven't told anyone. We haven't, not yet. But it's been, it's, we, we've been doing our bit here from the studio. Fully solar powered, solar powered renewable studio here in Pretoria. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure. And yep. I can't wait for next year. Thank you, sir. And to everyone who's tuned in after over all our platforms, been engaging with us over Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, as well as on our Zoom conference. Thank you so much. We will be getting in touch and we will shortly be also announcing EMSA 2022. We're going to keep the ship moving forward. We're going to keep it rolling forward so that we can keep the energy that we set to the last two days. To all our speakers who took time out of their days to present to us and prepare and be here with us, we'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you and to roughly the two two days of really great conversations that we've had yeah. i think it's been mind opening for everyone and it is freely available for anyone to go out there and educate themselves now on what is evs to all our participants to all the questions we've had over 200 questions over the last two days i think it just shows the need for information and knowledge that's out there people want to know yeah. it's been great so thank you to everyone thank you to all those people who registered and we will look forward to seeing you in 12 months time at emsa 2022 from myself rob walker and Devon Moodley here in studio, we'd like to wish you a re great rest of your Tuesday. Have a great rest of March, great rest of 2021, and we'll see you in 12 months' time. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Cheers. Goodbye.